The cities we live in, rich, complex, and busy. We often take our urban areas for granted. Amidst the bustle of commuting, shopping, and working, we tend to forget why things are the way they are. Do we question tree placement, building materials, architecture? Generally, the answer is probably not. As residents of Minneapolis, we frequently use our parks, light rail system, and libraries. These public amenities exist in other cities around the world, but design is what makes them unique to our city. Design contributes to our experience of place, but it is not the only factor. Public art also serves as a strong aesthetic component that defines our urban landscape. Our investigation is interested in combining public amenity and public art. Specifically, our interest is in public toilets. With this film, we aim to start a conversation about implementing public art toilets in downtown Minneapolis. You know, um, the American city today has a lot of advantages, and it's probably better on uh, many, many levels over the last 5 or 10 or certainly 15, 20 years ago. But the biggest challenge I have with where cities are in America today is that, uh, too often they're franchised, they feel uh, quite the same. Uh, we're losing our unique cultural identities in place and people. So I really love the role that public art can play in, uh, in creating unique indigenous local places. Mm -hmm. um, there's this great word in architecture that used to be used in Frank Lloyd Wright's pieces. I, I think it's pronounced antochthonous. It means it grows on the ground as opposed to being imposed on it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of uh, American cities right now feel as if uh, there's no connection to the people or the place there. Uh, public art, better than anything, does that. The concern for, you know, for public art, the concern for um, enhancing the, you know, the appearance, you know, of space, of public space, it is a, you know, it's an old one. It's not new. I mean, the Agora is a perfect example, you know, of that. And then we move quickly forward. to the New Deal, you know, where art played a very important part in the public sector. Uh, Roosevelt's program was a very big one. Artists were employed in public places like post offices and public libraries and schools, you know, were all um, enhanced you know, by supporting the artists who were unemployed. helps us move past this challenge of talking about toilets so that we might reconsider the terms public and private in regards to available amenities. Our project works involving both art, history, and a, you know, basic human need, a toilet, that that changes um, how people perceive it or how it affects. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you're talking to somebody who uh, got uh, just uh, beaten up pretty badly publicly for advocating uh, artist designed drinking fountains, which I think oh, is a yeah. great idea and I'm going to continue to do. Um, the, it easily can get trivialized when it's hugely important to take everyday function and elevate it. Um, and uh, I'll stand by that kind of work any day of the week. Actually, the story is I'm like standing in this lobby, like right over there, right. and then thinking, how can we connect water-rich Minnesota 
right, with the rest of all of this. Sandy Spieler's Invigorate the Common Well project inspired Minneapolis to commission a series of water fountains to be placed in various locations around the city as part of a discussion centered on the privatization of water. And I look over at our drinking fountain that was this dark hole, yeah, with the broken fountain and the sign out of order, and I just went, well, duh. <laughs> right. In the heart of the beast, right, in the heart <laughs> of this building, you know, how disregarded the central place. Right. And I started thinking about drinking fountains as the modern uh, manifestation of the public well, where people would come and greet each other and say, hello, how are you? And, and if the water was good for me, it would also be good for you. And if it right. wasn't, it, and suddenly you would understand that you're all connected by this water source. What really has to happen is when you, when you think about the, um, what we inherit. You know, when, when I walk by uh, a manhole cover from 7,500 years ago, and it's a spectacular piece, I know, as somebody who has to do the tough work of doing budgets and everything else, that you can't always afford to make that an expensive piece, but you can make every piece beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's great to go into a museum. I love museums. I like the place I live even more, and I, I need the beauty there. The public art ties in very well, you know, with this new awareness of our whole visual culture. You know, what, what about this visual culture? How do we see it? We're bombarded with so many things at once. You know, are we making any sense out of it? Are we taking time, you know, to understand it, to absorb it, and to do something, you know, with it in our own lives? I've always felt that uh, we have to rethink this idea about pretty basic function that people right. do. Uh, Boston uh, took a system that was used in Paris a long, long right. time ago. Um, and I used to be back in the downtown council and looking at these back then. That wasn't as much about art as much as creating an opportunity to have, you know, a basic place to go to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> right. Which is, uh, you know, not something people want to sit around talking about all the yeah. time, but it's yeah. something to do. <clears throat> uh, that's no surprise. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I, I think, uh, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time talking about that particular issue, but right. just generally I think it's important that uh, the public realm is beautiful and, and has, uh, has also some element of surprise in it. So I don't isolate public art in one place, and no. I, I think the issue of bringing all of those elements together, and I think the intersection between art and nature is a huge one in, uh, in the places we live. Flush is a Portland, Oregon-based community organization concerned with the availability of public toilets in Old Town, Chinatown. They have since partnered with City Council to open public toilets throughout the city. Somehow the idea of public toilets being something that were helpful for our neighborhood because Old Town, Chinatown is a tourist neighborhood and a working neighborhood and a lot of public transportation goes through mm -hmm. it. There's some residents, but it's not a very strong residential community. Um, we have social service agencies there, and um, bike commuters, and, uh, and, a, and a large, and again, I just repeat again, a large tourist destination. And so we're thinking about what would be things that would help benefit our neighborhood, because the neighborhood itself is kind of struggling to um, be a flourishing neighborhood. It's not a very populated um, neighborhood with either people with residencies or stores and storefronts and such. And one of the things that came up was a need for uh, public restrooms. Every neighborhood is kind of needs like a holistic, I think needs a holistic kind of approach to what's needed. Um, you know, potentially a, like, uh, potentially a de like a downtown, or potentially a nightclub district might need to try out night toilets. Right. You know, or something that are public urinals and other places um, with high traffic can go for paying, possibly paying toilets. Where right. people uh, examples like in France and other and uh, and even I think New York and I think San Francisco use uh, paid paid toilets, yep. uh, automatic public toilets with 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 a coin slot and stuff, and that's and with those can pay for themselves with advertising. So they're different. They're different types of facilities. Having restrooms available to the public, uh, I think, would be very good. A lot of the people don't buy anything in the store. And so I'm paying for toilet paper and the water and the cleaning and yeah. the time. Were the bathrooms here ever 
like privatized, like locked. You had to get a key from they, the front desk. Yeah, they tried that, but then again, now we're having to take our productivity and lower it because we're trying to stop, you know, the bad stuff that happens in the restrooms. Yeah. Maintenance is the hugest thing. I mean, I think you could probably get funding to get a prototype done, but then the question yeah. is, are you going to go and clean it three times a day? Yeah, maintenance is a big issue. Exactly. It's gigantic. And, and if you look at, you know, even in the not public, well, in, in the public spaces downtown, you know, there's, a, there's usually a chart on the wall that says how often the thing is being cleaned. They're being mm -hmm. cleaned every two hours. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's a lot of maintenance. I have a feeling that, I, I have a feeling that people sometimes are just afraid to ask other people to clean public toilets, clean toilets for a living or a job. Thing. And I know from going to many festivals and uh, it's like songwriting festivals that, that people are, who are volunteers that come and volunteer at these festivals are on the potty crew. Right. They're on the potty volunteer crew or the sanitation crew as they call them. And they clean public toilets and they come back year after year and this is their job. They're proud to do this every year. Right. So people who volunteer are, are happy to, I know are happy to clean toilets in the scenarios. I can only imagine that there are people out there who are willing to clean toilets and as a profession and accept tips or just an hourly wage for it. It's something that we haven't we haven't been able to do in Portland yet and somebody somebody really needs to try it out to see if there is um, a uh, a paid attendant at a toilet that can be you know work for tips as well. Right. For lots of reasons, especially if on the, on the street level they'll they, they're they're responsible for keeping it clean. Right. Um, it creates a job. It'll help with safety. So you got sanitation, safety, a job. I think like eyes on the street and somebody that cares about something right. will even help reduce with street level crime. Right. You know, get another person that and more people involved in neighborhoods. And, and if it does keep down vandalism too, that that's a cost. Right. That's a, that's a cost that you can look at yep. and say, okay, you know, that's one of those things we were trying to look at with the with the parks rehabilitating this park. Right. So after a year, if there's you know, thirty thousand dollars worth of damage, and we could have paid somebody to be there, and there might have only been ten thousand dollars worth right. of damage. We basically just paid for a person. Right. Now, you know, there are, there are places around the world where this is a service is provided, and it's somebody's job to do the cleaning, and they do it. But that's not so much a way that we've tended to behave in this country. Our patterns are very different here um, than they are in Europe. All of these things that we're talking about here are you know, not as much of a concern uh, to the European population as they are to us. We, we, we still live by a certain kind of Puritan ethics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something you know, that, that you're going to be crossing, yeah. breaking them down. Yes. And we have been struggling with it for a long time. <laughs> Will this Puritan ethic hold up when you desperately need to use the toilet? I look. So, I'm not. A, I'm. You know me well enough. I am not an artsy person <laughs> guy. Um, all I want to know when I go to the bathroom is: is that a toilet <laughs> there? Or not? You know, it doesn't have to be shaped like Taj Mahal or, yes. or think, anything like that. <laughs> Do you think people would have more of a, a, a vested interest in using them and not abusing them if they were more artistic and more? Not with the people we're talking about. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. They're only just homeless people in this big bracket that tend to be of a lower economic class. Sometimes they're um, people who are off their medications, or they're very dirty, or and so people get it, that becomes some of the first things that people think about when it comes to public toilets, as opposed to with at the sacrifice of the need for women who are pregnant. Correct. Tourists who need <laughs> yep. to want to go downtown, keeping a lively downtown, yep. um, and access to public toilets, and the the ability to, to have a sanitary toilet to go on is not necessarily so complicated. It's all really a pretty small surface that you just need to right. be able to desanitize yourself, right. and it shouldn't be too complicated. It's not like you're walking into, um, you know, a, a room full of, of Influenza, or, or you know, a flu-ridden room. Yeah, you know, it's just it's just a, a surface yeah. area, and and maybe you know maybe in terms of whatever is available for people, uh, for their for 
tools to do that kind of cleaning if it's dis disinfectants or a toilet cover or something like that. The issue of safety, the issue of uh, usage of uh, space, uh, the issue of sanitation. Yeah. Meters. Sustainability. Yes. And, and a lot of social issues here because, you know, are these facilities going to be used as, you know, restroom facilities or are they going to be, you know, centers for drug trading? Or are they going to be centers, you know, for sexual encounters? Right. I mean, these are things that are raised when you have an enclosed unit like that. Um, so it's, you know, it, you, know, you can't think idealistically that, right. you know, it's going to be used strictly as right. a, you know, one-stop facility. Sort of um, safety issues that might be involved with having something like that around town? Well, there's always an issue because it's an enclosed space and right. some nasty person could hide inside of it and harm people, but I think most of the available evidence, and I haven't seen a lot because I haven't gone looking for it, but I think most of the available evidence I've seen is that, you know, they're, they're not places that attract crime. They're actually places that serve a deeply felt human need. You know, will criminal behavior occur? Yeah, sure, but it'll occur even if you don't have public toilets. Yeah. So I don't think that's a precipitating factor for... People assume that. It's not true, but people do assume that there's more crime because there are more people. In fact, if there are more people, there's less crime, but... Because there's more eyes to look out Exactly. For. The Portland Loo is a successful public toilet model that promotes safety and hygiene while being cost effective. Uh, City Commissioner for Portland, uh, Leonard's developed a, a prototype of, of a freestanding public toilet called the Portland Loo. Okay. And that is a, that's available for, for sale to other cities, I guess they, they patented or whatever. And I think they're trying to get the price on that after the prototype down to under $20,000 oh, okay. for the toilet and it gets piped directly into the city sewer system okay. and it has a solar panel on the top that helps run the electrical part and there's a lot of thinking about how people use toilets and where to put the sink and where to put um, where to deal with issues like vandalism so the toilets in there you can see down to see if there's more than one set of legs inside okay. the toilet at one time or if somebody's passed out on the floor That's um, good they can get out and then the hand washing is on the outside so people aren't inside bird bathing and washing down you. Yeah. and you can wash hands on the outside and it just kind of drains it's not even a sink it just kind of drains into the street okay um, and then the individual panels can be removed and replaced and then worked on back in the shop if things get seriously vandalized okay. but they're you know kind of, I think they're made of, of high um, vandal proof um, systems of uh, 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 materials. We are in an economic recession allowing fewer funds for public programming. However, this also presents opportunities for public amenity community activism. In a way, I think we can almost talk about this period which you are, you know, ground level of and it's very exciting to see that. It's a renaissance. It is, you know, we're, we're beginning to open up all kinds of ways of looking and thinking and exploring um, and not hiding, you know, it, it's coming outside of the cave. Yes. We're always in the cave looking at the chatter, but um, I think this is a time. This conversation embodies much more than toilets. It is multifaceted and ties together important questions about art, social justice, and ultimately what makes us human. Our hope is that this film inspires community-based discussions that broaden conceptions of common space and de-emphasize current models of privatization. It is the toilet that brings all of these issues to us because, in the end, when you gotta go, you gotta go.